you all for coming along, and today we have a guest with us, which is known to many of you, who's a Sophie Craig Depp. You're welcome into the stage. Hello. How are you doing today? Doing good, doing good. Craig already being distracted by his own collection of retro things there. I don't get to see them that much. They're normally in storage. Yes, Craig is quite well known with the community. He has been collecting retro for 20 years now and has one of the largest, most complete boxed collection of retro consoles. I'm going to say in the universe, it's um, probably the world, definitely Europe, um, but we'll go for the universe, I think, just to... Yeah. Yeah. Just to make it big. Universe. Yeah, we, we might as well. Go for the full hype, I think we will in this case. And I don't think anyone can prove that it isn't the universe. Um, I'll say that in a spaceship that would just immediately land in the ground and point out they've got one more console that was only released on Jupiter and the whole thing will be blown out of proportion. But assuming that doesn't happen, I think we can clearly say you've got one of the largest retro collections going on planet Earth. Um, and as well as that, Quang is known for being a Game Boy developer. That's one thing I did. Having worked in the tech industry. Yes. Making retro t-shirts that we were both sporting. Oh, yeah. Yeah, that too. Being a great dancer, because why not? All of these things are connected by a love and a joy for technology and gaming. How did that start? Where did your joy of gaming start? Um, I guess memories of gaming start with the Atari 2600. Who had one of those? Yeah. yeah, lots of love for you, 2600. Yeah, um, so playing that, playing combat, um, my dad had got this for family and me and my brother just played that all the time and we loved that species. And then I guess moving on from that click of vision and then throughout the ages. Yeah, and just continue to love gaming. And from that point, you set your sights on becoming a, a Game Boy developer. Um, yeah, it was, it was one of those things. So I started then probably on the ZX Spectrum, uh, and on the one had the one, 28K Plus. Um, let, such a basic on that, then upgraded to an Atari ST, and that's DOS, basic on that. Uh, and then finally got a, my first PC, which was a 386 laptop, and um, learned C. And from there, learned Game Boy programming. There was a, an SDK released release called GBK, and uh, learned C and Z80 assembly. Um, and there were emulators were starting up, so we could make stuff on your, on your laptop. And then the flashcards came with real hardware, and it was very cool stuff. Big Game Boy games. Yeah, and you actually work professionally in the industry developing some games. So you've got a couple of the games that you contributed to here with you as well. Yeah, so um, we, I was lucky enough, I, I made a port of Jetpack on the Game Boy, um, and that was quite well recognised, and it actually got me a job working for a small company called Graphic State, and we got the license to do the Lego racing game, uh, Lego Stunt Rally game. Um, so about 90% of the code in here is my code, which is quite cool. Nice to see stuff in the cartridge. How would a child of you have felt seeing that you'd moved into actually developing these Game Boy games? Um, yeah, it's one of those things, you know, ever since I was a kid and played the computers, I wanted to be a game programmer, make video games, and then to see your game on the actual console, on a Game Boy, it's... Yeah, so cool. Literally blew your mind. And at that point, had you already started collecting as well, or did you not know it was um, collecting? Yeah, it's like the... Like, you get your consoles and you've got to go and growing up, and I, I, I like holding on to stuff, and I like the boxes they come in. So, everything I had, I kept the boxes for them and held on to them. Uh, I guess in 2000 or so, um, I had amassed a sizable collection already to just buying consoles. Uh, we went from, from uh, sort of Atari through Spectrum ST, uh, then the Game Boys, Atari. Yeah, my brother had the Lynx, my other brother had the Game Gear, um, then we had a Nintendo, and I got a Sega Saturn, and it just kind of added up to that. And then I said, found it on the Game Boy, obviously, and I started programming for it, so I got a vast array of Game Boys. And then people started noticing that out of the Sega and Nintendo, I had the majority of the consoles. Uh, and so it became my collection, and then uh, from there. Yeah, I hear this a lot from people that are prolific retro collectors. It's basically their hoarders that got out of hand. <laughs> and I, I've seen pictures of of your house, which effectively just looks like this. There's, I, there's barely any furniture. There's no people in there. It is is just effectively this. Um, this photo here um, actually made up of multiple photographs. Each segment is a crate. I keep the consoles in. Um, I don't actually have enough space because I live in London, there's no space in London, um, to display them, which is sad. But uh, each crate has one console. 
this photo was taken in 2015, the end of 2015. That was five years ago, and my photo has grown sizably since then. I'm currently at over 230 odd box consoles unique. So I, 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 let, me, let me clarify this, clarify this. So everything I collect has to be have changeable games, so either cartridges or CDs. So something like the Ouya doesn't count. Yeah. So the digital downloads. I'm not, I'm not really a big fan of digital downloads. Yeah, I want anyway. physical media. Um, it also has to be an, an official release. So uh, none of the Japanese Famicom clones. I don't have Pami clones or Pong clones because obviously they don't have capable media and there's thousands of those and I'm not going to go down that route. Um, it's probably best to go down that route. You need to buy a bigger house. Also, because uh, it has to be, they want the box as well, it has to be an official release. So prototypes don't count either. Um, I don't collect color variations because for me it's the same console. So the pink Hill Kit Dreamcast is the same as the like, regular Dreamcast. They mention that, you know, that's the source spot. I can buy that. Uh, but the N64 comes in many, many different colours, um, so they don't count. But the N64 Pikachu version yeah. is physically a different console. I mentioned that, yeah. So that counts as a separate console. So there's 230 odd unique consoles in my collection that are not a variation of another one. Uh, if you add variations, because I have many Game Boy variations too, you're probably looking at 300 plus very easily. Those of you who no handhelds, you know the Game Boy, you know Nintendo's Kong handhelds, you know Sega did a few, you know Atari did a few. You have no idea how many more there are that aren't Sega, Nintendo and Atari. And many of them are very, very bad. <laughs> They're all bad. The Game.com is a, a, a wonderful machine. So there's three variations of the Game.com. Game and they didn't need to be one. There's the original, there's the pocket, <laughs> and there's a pocket with the backlight. <laughs> it's just it's got pop. one LED. It's, 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 it's a very unhappy little device. It, it wants to be a games console. It's basically not PDA. But yeah, so, so Kekin's taken me down the route of finding out about new consoles and you post about them and you think you know about all the consoles that are out there. And then someone goes, oh, do you have um, a Koei Passi Paso Go? And you go, what's a Koei Passi Go? Yeah. So you go and search about it and, and you find out another console, so you add that to your list. And between, I guess, 2010, 2010, and now, there were so many added to my list, many Japanese ones. Um, Ms. Alan Chang, who's here, introduced me to Yahoo Japanese auctions, and then all my money went away. <laughs> I feel like he's an enabler. <laughs> because the number of Japanese consoles that we never saw is in immense. I should, change, I should change slides actually. So at what point, I, I feel like saying at what point did you realise this has got completely out of hand, um, but also at what point, we've worded, at what point did you realise you had moved from hoarder into professional collector? At what point did you actually actively start saying this is now a collection and I'm trying to complete this? So I think in 2011 or 2012, there about, I had 75 consoles and I thought I must have needed all of them by now. I mean, we're so close. Oh no! So I thought maybe, maybe there's a hundred various consoles out there or so, and yeah, I thought I must be close to that. And so now I'm a collector. And then obviously find out more, and it's, I'm at two thirty now, and I reckon there's probably another fifty odd or so before I actually get close to finishing. There are so many out there. And then somebody will start sending links to even more obscure ones, and I've learned a lot just just from walking around. Um, <laughs> My poor friend's house, I've learned a lot of consoles I never knew existed. Um, and you also have taken a lot of these consoles. That's one of the things about your collection, is um, these aren't just things that sat sealed in a box and no one ever touches them. Quang has been kind enough to share his collection with a lot of events. So some of the previous like play events and other events you've been to, those ridiculously rare things where you walk past and you go, what, is, is that a DVD player? Is, is that a boom box? Is that a, is that a sticker machine? Is that lost? And you turn find out that's a console. These often have belonged to, to Quang. So you make sure these stay working, you make sure these stay played and stay loved. Um, presumably because that's how you think consoles should be. Oh, for sure. Consoles are meant to be played. So um, you can see up there, I'm holding the Telstar Arcade, which is the weird triangle console here. I bought the sealed. It's, a, uh, it's nearly as old as I am. It's, it's a 40-year-old console. And I broke the seal on live stream because it's meant to be played. Um, and <laughs> oh, we 
panicked. I was worried at that point we were going to need to duck and run. Okay, we're getting cheers. That's good. Uh, if you've been to Play Expo, Manchester, or Blackpool, or Revival, um, you've possibly played one of my consoles uh, in the red section. Because, um, yeah, they need to be played, and I don't have time to play them, and they're usually in storage. So the only time they do get played is when I take them out to events. So uh, hopefully you've enjoyed them. Yeah, and I think that's one of the things about collectors like yourself and sharing those things with the world and also preserving those things because it's a conservation act and that's one of the things I don't think people really understand about collectors is you're also preserving and conserving these things for future generations. Yeah, for sure. One of the things I think in the back of the box is there's as many collectors just collect the machines. Yes, it's a lot easier and a lot cheaper and which I, I wish I'd start doing that but too late now. I'm down the road when I'm collecting boxes, um, but the boxes are a huge part of preserving the history. Um, when you're a kid and you're in the store, you can't buy every console, so you look at the beautiful boxes on the shelves, and someone took time and effort to, to design boxes, and the, the, you can see when they're 70s, 80s, and 90s, you can see the time changes, it's amazing. Yeah, and sometimes they are very off their time, and sometimes when the boxes are terrible, that also tells you something. Again, not again, the packaging for that's beautiful. The logo is, is it looks like a web URL and it's not. Bedroom probably looks like this. There is a bed under there somewhere, I assume. So that's the edge of my bed, it's there. Yeah. And it goes that way. Um, that's my floor, and right at the top there is the ceiling. So literally, it's floor to ceiling. We can see a bit of floor. Yeah. How long ago was this photo taken? Is that floor still there? Mm, yeah. <laughs> it's not sure. Um, so these crates are made by really useful boxes, and this is the largest crate they do. It's 184 litres. It's a massive. Power console, goodness. Yeah, about this size. Mm, this size. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, there is 20 of these crates, um, and there's also stuff that doesn't fit in the crates. You can see a Divers 2000 series there, and above that, PC Engine monitor uh, above that. That's my, that's my bedroom. Yeah, this is, this is, a lot of people here, you're looking at your future. It, it is glorious, but we may find you several years later under a pile of boxes, just lying there saying, it was worth it, <laughs> when they all come crashing down. Uh, but it is an incredible, beautiful collection, and we do massively appreciate the fact that you share these things with us. And that you've brought some super rare things here with you as well, all yeah. fully working, all fully working consoles. Have you got anything here which is, apart from the, the Game Boy games you worked on, obviously, mm. is any of the ones here something that you were, have tried to find for a long time and incredibly proud to have For changed? sure. Um, so, this is the Entex Adventure Vision. Um, this is... I'm going to pass this over to you to handle... I'll try more. <laughs> Do you, do you want to know how much it costs? <laughs> Is this one of those things where you hand me something and then I'm terrified? I got lucky with quite a bunch of stuff, so I didn't pay as much as this is worth. This was bought as broken, um, but I got it home and it's working, so... I'm now holding this gently as if it were a newborn, um, because I fear I may be holding more than my yearly income's worth of money in, in the form of plastic and capacitors. So if you... He's not correcting it, I'm hand it back. <laughs> if you know how the console, um, the Virtual Boy screen works, it's actually a line of LEDs um, and a spinning mirror, uh, which refreshes very, very quickly and displays it. This is the same thing, this is a line of 15 LEDs and a mirror. Some of them are incredibly rare. What would you say the rarest thing you own is? That's quite tough to say. It's either... Because something's are rare but they show up enough that you could buy one. But there are things that are not maybe not expensive but they never ever show up. Um, the, the brown box, the Diver 2000 is a big plus TV. I don't have a picture lined up of it unfortunately. Um, but I don't know if you've ever seen it. It's like, it looks like a big space helmet in blue. It has a Dreamcast uh, flip top lid. And it's effectively a CRT that looks like if Sonic the Hedgehog were a space helmet and it has a dream cost in the top oh, of it. I can show you these. Yeah. These are Super Famicom SF1s. These are, <laughs> these are CRTs with the two Famicom built into them. This is, with the front is the two 14 inches, and back is the 21 inch screens. Um, I now have six of these sitting at home. Uh, I, I got kind of addicted to them. Um, the PC Engine LT down the end is a wonderful PC Engine which I picked up in Japan. I went to Japan for a friend's wedding and I decided once I'm over there, I'm going to buy some consoles because I'm here 
I went over with just a backpack, and then I came back with two full suitcases full of stuff. Did you make it to the wedding? Oh yeah, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, just checking. <laughs> went to the wedding first, and then went. Uh, that's the way to do it. Yeah, two large consoles. Um, I picked up that, um, the one the Mega One, the one Mega Two, uh, a Dual RX PC Engine, and a few other things. But there was one of the bit picked up in Japan, which is great stuff. Uh, Talk about Game Boys, but Game Boy over there is my first Game Boy, so which, which is real nice to have. Very good pass. So we have a head closet that should make it. So yeah, so nice. It's game here. Very good pass doesn't count. <laughs> is that just in general because it's digital? For, for various reasons, one uh, it doesn't count. <laughs> <laughs> And that's one of the things for retro collecting is that it's gained popularity. You've been collecting for 20 years, um, and obviously, as it's gained momentum, in some ways, that's been wonderful because it means more people are part of the retro community. We get incredible events like Play Expo now. We're very popular and growing in size because we are all now enjoying the love of these consoles. More retro collectors appearing, but for someone who is hoarding one or or six, apparently <laughs> collecting. Sorry, sorry. Um, <laughs> all of these things. You're watching the, the marketplace, the prices, and the availability and things change. How has your experience as a collector um, changed and evolved over the last 20 years? For sure. We've seen the the prices, prices of things shoot up. Uh, I used to collect games as well, so Game Boy games, PC Engine, and Sega Saturn. They were all my loves. Um, and then games got just got ridiculous. I think I paid over 500 for a Game Boy game. And that was kind of the breaking point, like, what the hell am I doing? Um, so as long as I have the hardware, I'm happy with that. The games, I can work out different ways. There are flashcards, there are um, obviously emulators and things like that. You can play the games, but the hardware is something that needs to be, uh, uh, has to be kept. Yeah, so um, I, I want to show you... I can see these pictures, Paul, so I'm as interested in you. So, uh, yeah, so the Super Famicom TVs are... Uh, became sort of an obsession to me. But I saw it ages ago in, I think it's Meme Cheese magazine, the, or maybe CVG. And um, I thought, I really want one of those. And then it never happened. And I completely forgot about it. And then I went, to market, I went to a London game market once, and the Alan Love had one on show. And um, it just reignited this love for this. He told me about your Japanese oceans, and then I've been hunting them down feverishly since then. And it's a weird gamble shipping them over because shipping a CRT from Japan to the UK it's very likely going to be broken when it arrives and now you sort of gamble paying a bunch of money and then you hope it turns up in working in one piece and it's quite buzz when it does work and it's quite sad when it doesn't um, I think I had a problem but so I, I took these um, out for a little drive <laughs> this is a family outing <laughs> <laughs> um, so it was two over there. Tucked in with seatbelts, two over there. To read, so yeah. um, it always wear your seatbelt. Um, don't put your kids on the floor though. <laughs> yeah, it's slightly different to, to real children, don't actually stack them in the boot. Um, <laughs> so we took them to get looked over because, uh, again, the machines are also really repairing, and then we tell them the story. <laughs> <laughs> if anyone was ever in doubt of. Of Quang's love, all his consoles. <laughs> Can you see what I'm reading? Yeah. A Spectrum Plus 2 blueprint. <laughs> <laughs> it is the Spectrum Plus 2 blueprint. <laughs> so it's the circuit for the power circuit. So you know, they need to know all these stuff. They're, they're coming off from Japan. They don't know about UK stuff. So you can tell them, tell them these stories. So part of picking consoles is also playing stuff around consoles as well. And you end up with plushies like this. Um, this is only available in Japan, was only available in Japan. Um, I think two years up, I don't know whether the typical one is. You're looking after one at the moment, Bex. Uh, one of them is currently being fostered by me and is in the background of my live streams, and it's called Monty the Mega Drive. Um, it's, it's an incredible plushie because it has controllers for hands, and also, I, I probably I can't see it on the yeah. it, His foot is, is a plug. That's um, And it's lovely to see the, the, the detail and the love put into these things. Um, I don't have a problem, honestly. It's, it's just. It's, it's not a problem. Because partly we all get to play these consoles and get to enjoy them at these events, so we're exceptionally happy that this is continuing. Uh, it's 
Monty the last slide for this yeah. one? We'll leave a picture of Monty up. Does anyone have any questions they would like to ask Quang about his collection? Hello, a very impressive collection. Um, do you count the At Games Mega Drive that are officially released? <coughs> so, so I, I don't actually have one. Um, and it takes cartridges. And it's an officially licensed product. Um, but Sega literally gave their brand away to pretty much anyone who would make something with it. And I personally do not count the Sega at games things as consoles that need to be, need to be collected. But you still have one? I, I do have one. Right, thank you. Just, just to clarify that, you do still have one despite the fact you've just said it doesn't count and you're only buying things that count. What's your question, Sam? Cheeky Chris here. Um, is there a character that you main? So, so he's asking, yeah, which is my main character. Yeah. So I can play all the characters really well because a big part of being the Street Fighter player is you play everybody so you learn the weaknesses and strength. But my main is Zangief, uh, which I play a lot of. Um, just because back then no one really knew how to play with a character that was that slow, that viables, um, needs to be up and close. Um, now, uh, Grapplers is part of parcel of fighting games. But, Back then, it was just hilarious to beat people with Zangief, and people were like, why are you picking him? He's rubbish, he's slow. And then you beat them, and I, I play one-handed sometimes. Um, <laughs> well, it's also on the phone with the other hand, having a conversation, and also DJing. If, if, if you hold the joystick in your pinky, and you can use your thumb to hit buttons, you can play Street Fighter one-handed in the arcades, and beat people with that, who just slayed your main character as being rubbish. It's quite satisfying. So you're not competitive, but you learn to be good enough at playing a character no one else wanted to play in Street Fighter that you could control the arcade with one hand just to teach them a lesson. I enjoy winning. <laughs> yeah, just, just, just kind of right, that's fine. While I'm down here, is there any more questions? Are you working on any games yourself right now? And if so, where could they find them? Nicely leading us into the next section. Thank you very much. <laughs> Cheers, Dan. I appreciate the segue. Good. It's a seamless segue. We completely planned that. It's wonderful. So, yeah, as a game developer, I went to that as a kid, and now I develop indie games. If you go over to the indie section on the other side, uh, there's some wonderful indie games, including mine, which is Mau Mau Castle. It's a game about a flying cat dragon who chases rainbows. Um, those of you who are fans of Space Harrier will recognize it as a my love letter to Space Harrier and all things 90s. Um, I grew up playing arcade games in the 90s and they're my favourite, so let's make a game about that sort of stuff. The game is looking to be launched next Saturday. Next Saturday, I can see the pressure. Indie dev. This is, this is a true indie dev here. You can see the pressure of terrifyingly announcing a launch date because these games are made with love and these games are made by people in their bedrooms I mean you're making your game with your brother um, and your t-shirt company Pocket Pixels which is just over there by the door for anyone that wants to check out the t-shirts we are wearing it, it's with your other brothers these are family businesses these are things that are made with love and passion and insomnia and a small amount of madness and they are <laughs> incredible things and we're very lucky to have people like you in the community Collecting these consoles, preserving them, letting letting sharing the joy of them with us, and it is all massively, massively appreciated. So you have obviously Pocket Pixels is over in the corner over there. If people want to check that out in a minute, and over in the main hall, you can find with the other indie games you can have a go on Mount Mount Castle, which is absolutely an incredible game. Um, and yeah, thank you very much, Brian, for sharing these things with us. Your your hit with collection is incredible and your contribution to this community is incredibly, incredibly appreciated. Give me so some love. Thank you very much, guys. Hey, Novabug here. I do hope you enjoyed this video. Please support the channel by liking and commenting, and of course subscribing if you haven't already done. If you would like to support me further, please consider joining my bug army via Patreon. And also don't forget to follow me over at Facebook, Twitter, BitChute and Twitch. And finally a very special mention to my Bug Army Generals Sam M, Sweet Nanook and Craig Harrison. Thank you everyone for supporting me. Nova Bug, out.